People often claim that fat people don't prioritize their health, and that people who don't prioritize their health are poor role models and shouldn't be represented positively in the media. For today, I'm setting aside the fact that this is both completely untrue, and that even if it was true, it would still be extremely messed up to discuss the almost unbelievable hypocrisy that is committed any time this argument is made, and specifically on Super Bowl Sunday. Because if people who don't prioritize their health are poor role models, and shouldn't be represented positively in the media, then what is this whole Super Bowl thing about? Where is the insistence that football players aren't good role models because they aren't prioritizing their health? Where are the calculations of how expensive football players, from Pop Warner to Pro, will be, not just from sports injuries while they play, but from the fallout from concussions and the constant pounding their joints take? Where is the won't somebody think of their knees hand wringing? Where are the calculations of how much money could be saved if instead of playing football, those who participated just walked 30 minutes a day, five days a week? Where is the government-sponsored war on football playing? And all of that despite the fact that body size is complicated and not entirely within our control. And we don't have a single study where more than a tiny fraction of people were able to change their body size. But playing and not quitting football is absolutely a choice. To be clear, people are allowed to play football. My point here is that this whole it's because of fat people's health that we treat them badly thing is just a crappy justification for size-based discrimination. And it's long past time to stop using healthism and ableism to justify sizeism and to end all of them instead. OCR Amazon replied, uh, where the heck has this person been? There's been a ton of talk about player safety. And for quite a while. It's harder to tackle with the new rules. It's the same tackle you fellas have always done, it's just a little safer on the noggin. Cut the nape of the nape. <laughs> Supporting him and lower him gently to the turf. Like a prince putting his princess to bed. Back of the head. Put your princess to bed! I'm so embarrassed of the first picture, but so proud of how far I've come. This is what going from 238 to 134 looks like. And someone replied, I'm happy you're proud of yourself, but I feel like saying you're embarrassing to be a certain weight is not it. I swear formerly fat people who lose weight have some of the worst fat phobia. I can't believe this woman's trying to crap all over somebody else's accomplishments. We stand here amidst my achievement, not yours! Imagine if students got to read the F it diet and health instead of being taught about the obesity epidemic. Just a thought. Yeah, but not all thoughts are worth sharing. I think of this sub as being like a bunch of cocaine addicts living in a world where everyone does cocaine and it's recommended by doctors and considered healthy. Ah, the 1920s. You've realized you can't handle cocaine. You're skeptical about other people handling it as well as they claim to. But that's another story and it's none of your business. Your doctor thinks you could handle cocaine if you only did it on the weekends and never in the morning. And think of all the energy you'd have, he says. You know he's wrong and cocaine on the weekends would be a terrible idea for you, so you smile and nod. Your mom talks about her cocaine use constantly. She's got a new dealer and is avoiding all those side effects with this new recipe, she says. You know that it's still cocaine and the effects aren't side effects, so you smile and nod because you know she's going to do it no matter what you say. Your coworker is very concerned about you because how are you going to go through life without cocaine? You will be lethargic, weak, unable to work for your hopes and dreams. She gives you the name of her dealer, who she swears is selling non-addictive cocaine. It's called no cane, not cocaine. See, there's a difference. She can see you need a boost. Your work has been so steady, in her mind, slow, lately. You take the number and throw it in the garbage can as soon as she walks away. Probably some of those people really do have their cocaine use under some level of control that they find acceptable. There may be some who don't experience the same problems you do. That's okay. It's none of your business and has nothing to do with you. You don't do cocaine. Not any kind. Not from any dealer. Period. We don't do diets. Not any kind. Period. Somebody made a little poster. What will my body do as an intuitive eater? It doesn't matter. Your body's gonna do what it's gonna do. I think it's a little weird that these people don't think of themselves as being in control of their life. Be careful not to confuse set point weight, natural weight, with normal BMI. 
Set point weight or natural weight is the weight your body prefers. Consider this a genetic blue, just like your height or shoe size. We tend to be fairly accepting of our height and shoe size, recognizing we don't have any control over them, therefore not putting any effort or energy into changing them. What is we approach our weight in the same way? Set point weight is generally reached when we are nourishing our body in a way that is adequate and not restrictive. Getting plenty of sleep, managing stress well, and engaging in joyful movement. The big misconception here is that our set point weight should fall into the normal BMI range. For some, their normal weight is a lower weight, and for others it's a higher weight. For some it means gaining weight, and for others it means losing weight. None of these are right or wrong, they just are. Side note, chasing set point weight is just as traumatizing as chasing a goal weight. Behaviors and experiences trump numbers every time. Reading an article like this, you'd never know that set point weight is total BS. Calories on menus are a terrible idea because the Venn diagram of people who know enough about calories to understand the information and people who have healthy relationships to that information is two circles that basically don't touch. Like, okay, there might be 3.5 food scientists in the intersection, but anyone else who can contextualize calories is probably someone for whom it's healthier not to. For everyone misconstruing me, I'm not saying it's impossible to be someone who knows about calories for reasons other than internalized fat phobia, or fat phobia full stop, but I'm saying it's extremely unlikely and there aren't enough of you to have calories on menus. Now so some of us only eat at restaurants is a rare treat. The calorie count sucks the pleasure right out of eating that amazing cheesecake. Yeah, there's nothing worse than having accurate information. She tried every diet on the planet. When will people learn that dieting does not work? You have to make a permanent change in your diet, not a temporary one. Lifestyle changes don't work either, at least not long term when there's a significant weight to lose. It all comes back. Those that keep off 20 pounds for 5 plus years are statistical anomalies, mere blips in the data. If there's a safe way to significant long term weight loss, we haven't found it yet. I wrote a whole response to the person calling us delusional and talking about how a great one meal a day calorie restriction was making them feel. But they deleted their comments, so I'll reply to you instead. Ha <laughs> I did IF for a year. I stopped when I realized it was an eating disorder. Here's the thing, every diet starts you off feeling better than ever. But you'll crash, you'll cheat, you'll binge. It's not because you are weak. It's because you're alive. No one can live on 1,500 calories a day for years or decades. Your body won't allow it. IF and calorie restriction will fail like every other diet you've ever tried because all diets fail eventually. But if you don't diet, the weight gain you'll experience anyway will come on slower or not at all. Because it's dieting that kicks your body into famine mode and forces it to binge and store fat at the first opportunity. Not dieting is not the same thing as having diabetes or being fat. Most skinny people in the world don't diet. We all have skinny friends that we've seen eat burgers and fries and seem to never gain weight, right? It's because they don't diet and they've always had a reasonable relationship with food. So they never messed up their metabolisms. It's not necessarily that they're born with a fast metabolism. Dieters slow theirs down by going on one diet after another. And it's very hard to reset your metabolism once you do that. The only rule I still kind of adhere to is to not eat processed foods all the damn time. I do think when people eat overly processed foods multiple times per day, that's legitimately messing with them, leading to weight gain. I mean, obviously, right? Overweight and obesity was much rarer before processed foods went mainstream. Look at the group photo of Americans prior to World War II. They're mostly rail thin. None of them ever dieted in the way we understand that term today. But don't read that as an endorsement of paleo or Whole30. I firmly believe that sometimes you just need a coke, and that's okay. Three square meals a day will not make you fat. Ice cream or Doritos a couple of times a week if you crave them will not make you fat. But obsessing over food and cutting out whole food groups or entire meals will. Perhaps not at first, but eventually. That was a strange combination of facts and fallacies. And they admit that it's processed food that's making us fat, but at the same time, they don't want you to quit eating processed food. They really need to make up their mind. I love the amount of self-righteous people who come out whenever programs like this are on. Flippant comments like, just eat less and move more. 
just play a sport and cut down on portions, etc., etc. If it were that easy, no one, I repeat, no one would be overweight. Seen hashtag how to lose weight well is trending. I assume this is a 30 second show where they say, eat less, move more, sorted, not working, move even more, eat even less, repeat until it's sorted. Some people just can't handle the reality that weight loss actually is that simple, I guess. Ugh, that post has got me thinking about fat acceptance in a way I haven't in years. I've read more studies about weight and health than probably any other topic I've ever researched. And every time I see someone wail about health, I'm just like, did you know that in post-mortem examinations, there's zero correlation between weight and levels of arteriosclerosis and related diseases found? Did you know that people with an overweight BMI have the longest life expectancy? That those with an ideal or an obese have about the same life expectancy? And that being underweight raises mortality rates more than being morbidly obese? Did you know that losing weight and then gaining it back is worse for your heart than remaining at the weight you started consistently? Did you know that 95% of people who lose weight do gain it back? And there has never been a single documented weight loss program that has been demonstrated to keep the weight off for 5 years or more in the majority or even a significant minority of people. Like, telling people to lose weight isn't of much use if we don't know how to make that happen. Like, I've read The Obesity Myth by Paul Campos and Rethinking Thin by Gina Colada and Big Fat Lies by Glenn O'Glaz and Fat So and several of their books that I don't own and so don't remember all their names. I spent like four years reading every single study coming out and looking at the methodology and noting which ones had huge holes or terrible methods and which didn't. The holes were almost always in the pro weight loss studies and like Big Fat Lies has 27 pages of bibliography 27 pages worth of scientific citation. The book content itself is only 197 pages. That's a page of reference for every 7 pages of book. Reading the book is just a reference after reference and study after study. Most of these doctors like Linda Bacon, author of Health at Every Size, started out the same way. They wanted to use scientific method to find a real weight loss program or a health solution that worked or could be proven to work and so studied everything they could about weight and fitness, only to find out that we didn't need weight loss in the first place, that all the studies calling for it were lacking or non-existent, that weight and underlying metabolic health have very little relation, that the history of our relationship with health and obesity has little basis in fact and a lot of basis in capitalism, politics, and fashion. No, really. The association between weight and health was first proposed by insurance companies looking for ways to charge people more by claiming risk. They also charged tall and short people more, and people with different skin colors. When they got in trouble for charging people for things they had no control over and had no bearing on their health, they set out to prove that weight was controllable and that fat was unhealthy to make money. There are also a lot of the same people who went on to invent the President's Fitness Program, so if you went to public school you probably already hate them. Anyway, if you went to a place to start reading about the issue, this article is a pretty good launching pad. This casual rant is like a primer on weight science, amazing. I second their book recommendations and would add to the list Body Respect by Drs. Bacon and Frommar, Body of Truth by journalist Harriet Brown, and What's Wrong with Fat by UCLA professor of sociology Abigail Sogway. Yes, also Christy Harrison's book Anti-Diet, which releases in two days in her podcast. I don't know how to say this, but I don't believe for a second that this person spent two years reading every scientific study about dieting and then came to the conclusion that only the anti-diet books were the right ones. Just a reminder that intuitive eating is not eating only when you are hungry and stopping the moment you are full. That's a diet. Ugh, I covered this last week. Even on intuitive eating, you're supposed to stop eating when you're not hungry. My good friend is often dieting. She's thin and tall and wears a size 6, but often talks about needing to keep off extra weight. Personally, I am shorter but fatter than her, and I have a very body positive, health at every size mindset. She's been doing these fasts that have involved increasingly more fasting. At first it was the Daniel fast for three weeks. No meat, no wine, no rich foods, etc. Then she started doing the 16-8 fast, so only eating food for 16 hours a day. Then yesterday she told me she started fasting every other day, so 24 hours without food. 24 hours without in order to keep her weight low for her wedding in June. In my head I was like, what? I asked her if she's been doing so many fasts for health reasons and she rattled off a list of fasting benefits. 
lowers risk for cancer, lowers risk for heart disease, and increases discipline, and we left it at that in the moment. As her friend, I'm worried about her. I can't help but feel this is disordered eating, and it seems like she has a dysmorphic understanding of her body. And it's also hard for me to hear about her approach to her body and dieting, when I obviously weigh more than her and have visible fat. How should I approach this issue with her? I've done a little bit of research, and fasting seems to have some benefits and some drawbacks. But it's hard for me to think of it as anything but disordered eating and low body esteem. Am I missing something? How would you broach this topic if you were me? Let's be honest, your only issue is that they're talking about it with you. If somebody's talking about something you don't like, simply ask them to stop talking about it when you're around. It's not complicated. Live budget coaching. We've had so much fun this morning sitting down and helping you with dot dot dot. In all serious, does the boot camp continually return to diet culture? I adore your message, but diet talk is toxic and I'm working toward cutting it from my life. I can't invest in something that's going to continually bring that up. It uses all sorts of examples to help people relate to something that's not money. So yes, it uses the example of diet and weight loss to relate to what it might feel like to try to get out of debt. I've got to say saving money and weight loss are very, very good metaphors for each other. If you hold your breath for a long time and finally take your first panicked inhale, no one calls it loss of control breathing or binge breathing. We need that perspective for eating. Unless you're starving to death, when you binge, it's not because you were about to die. Unlike when you binge breathe. Healthism is the biggest threat to the integrity of the anti-diet movement. As the anti-diet message spreads and grows and hopefully changes the world, be vigilant. Do not let them strip us of our roots. Are they aware that health is literally in health at every size? It seems the movement has already been stripped of its roots. I love when doctors are like, before we do anything, you have to lose weight. Like, yeah, Haas, next time my car needs fixing, I'll be sure to uh, bring a smaller car. Why are you admitting you suck at your job? OCR Amazon replied. It's more like, if your truck needs fixing, you remove the four tons of stuff you've been hauling into bed, so the mechanic can put it on the lift. But the doctor told me to lose weight for my health. Cool, your doctor's just advised you to do something that has been proven unsustainable and harmful for the vast majority long term. It's lazy medicine. Listen to your fucking doctor. I'm getting so tired of privileged men claiming fat shaming isn't a gendered issue because they experience it too. Not only do you not experience it anywhere nearly as severe as women do, for men it's by and large a choice. The female body is genetically predisposed to store more fat, so no matter what we do, being fat is a genetic default for many women. To tell us to simply eat less or move more is literally shaming us for something we have no control over. Men on the other hand don't have that genetic makeup. When you see a fat man, you see a lazy man. Her brother replies, how about, no, you do not have a genetic condition, you're just lazy. Doctors have been telling you that for years. Mom doesn't have fat genes. Our sister doesn't have fat genes. You're the only fat woman in our household. A fat acceptance nutritionist posted. Before you say dietitians are not nutritionists, first consider the following. Qualified nutritionists are just as valuable. Yes, qualifications matter but they don't automatically make someone good at what they do. Being registered doesn't automatically reduce harm. Literally no one actually cares. I'm so tired of the whole nutritionist versus dietitian debate. Honestly, I do hold insecurity around it, but my biggest issue with this debate is that it's not actually helping anyone. The qualities that make me good at my job have little to do with my bachelor's degree, and I see that in other people too. You know what, when I need real advice, I'm gonna go to an expert, sorry. No offense. Eating sugar has a similar effect on the brain as doing heroin. Well, falling in love has a similar effect on the brain as doing cocaine. But I don't see you cutting out love, Karen. To put it plainly, dieting is a little bit like someone pissing on your leg and then telling you it's raining. Except it's more like someone pooping on your face and then asking you for a dollar, and then going into your house and systematically pooping on everything of value that you own, and then setting that poop-filled home that was once filled with the sound of laughter and love but that's now just filled with poop on fire and then blaming you for it. The person who posted this thought it was a perfect analogy. 
And now we have someone posting a bit of cognitive dissonance. Intuitive eating myth. You should never choose to eat foods that does not make you feel physically well. Truth. There is often a level of mental healing that needs to be achieved by eating the food with full permission in order to arrive at a neutral place with that food. And a few seconds later. Yes, intuitive eating is about tuning into your body's feedback and allowing it to be a factor in making choices about food. But she just said we can eat whatever we want as long as it has mental healing effects. Someone made a non-informative graph. Dieting. OMG, these cookies look so good. Must resist. Why can't I stop thinking about them? Okay, maybe I'll just have half of one. Darn it, now my diet is ruined for today. Screw it, I'll eat seven more. And then I'll spend the rest of the evening feeling guilty and planning to make up for it tomorrow. Intuitive eating. Oh my goodness, yum, these cookies look so good. I think I'd like to have one. Eats cookies. Yum, that was good. Moves on with life. And someone replies, Except I'll probably eat seven in both scenarios. Which is okay. But intuitive eating allows you to do it more intentionally and without the guilt. What the hell does that mean? Somebody expressed their hatred of the Fat Logic subreddit. Fat Logic is a wasteland. It's just a bunch of dude pros and a handful of people experiencing brief weight loss while weight cycling yo yo dieting that they think they can solve obesity by telling fat people to stop eating. Only go there if you're ready to watch people pretend they know everything about nutrition because they're either naturally thin or temporarily besting their biology by doing calories in, calories out. What can I say? Why need people amuse me? Somebody posted another non-informative graphic. Restricting. Gets upset when husband brings home her favorite chocolate. Feels like he's trying to sabotage the latest diet attempt. Relationship damaged. Living. Appreciates husband's sweet gesture by bringing her favorite chocolate. Enjoys chocolate without pressure and moves on. Relationship enhanced. Jay Creasy replied, Both you and your husband gain weight. Both of you lose attraction toward each other. Resent husband for not being attracted to your fat body. Get divorced. Relationship damaged. And now for the lie of the day. Even without sugar, I'd still be fat. I used to exist in a permanent state of the highest level of ketosis while simultaneously exercising nine hours daily while anorexic. I still started gaining rapidly during this time period. When anti-diet isn't easy, remember, that's just more proof that you aren't being lazy. We've had a lot of posts this week from people wrestling with the implications of anti-diet, the challenges of unconditionally accepting one's body, letting go of fear around foods, and letting go of the fantasy of attainable perfection that diets represent. It reminds me how hilarious it is to think that the HIES fat acceptance has anything to do with laziness, as detractors often say. If HIES were for lazy people, why the heck is it so damn difficult? I hope this week that all of you will give yourselves all the credit you deserve for keeping the deep mental and emotional work of anti-diet. You may or may not be logging miles at the gym, and your water loss may be more in the form of tears than sweat, but it's real work and good on you for sticking with it. Healy Hatman replies, what is difficult about eat whatever you want whenever you want and don't do any exercise that requires any effort whatsoever exactly probably gets asked to cut small pieces of cake i suppose how to read sizes properly s is for so hungry m is for merely adorable l is for love extra large extra love extra extra large exciting extra love extra 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 large love explosing Inviderzum replied, Love yourself unless you're a skinny bitch. You must be starving. Eat a burger, sweetie. Jenny X replied to that, Hey, only dogs like bones. Real men like... Ah, I can't be bothered. 